Welcome to Build, I'm Ricky Camilleri. Last year, documentary filmmaker Matthew Heineman made what I think is the best film about the crisis in Syria. This year, he returns to a subject he's already covered and knows very well, drugs. With his new series on Showtime, The Trade, Heineman takes a top-down look at the heroin trade by following smugglers, users, dealers, mixers, and the police tracking all of them. It's by far the most comprehensive verite look at the heroin crisis currently facing America. Let's take a look at a clip from the trade. My son miles of people who live in Amapola. It's a drug, we know. Anyone who tries it, they don't let them ask. It makes us like Superman. Sheriff's on the search warrant! Come out with your hands up. Oh, yeah. There's the money right there. Oh, we got four small children coming out. Drug trafficking is the most lucrative illegal trade out there. My role is to stop that flow of drugs coming into the United States. Heroin's a killer. It tears people apart, eats them away. I'm having young children myself. I couldn't imagine them growing up without me or without their mother. He's going to be a soldier in the army of I never thought that I would ever be like this, that I would continue to do something that would kill me. Get out of my house. I'm so tired of this. He's going to be a soldier in the army of No hay empleos pues aquí en la sierra. Yo no quiero ver a mi familia que sufra. I will never give up on my child. One day, he's either going to leave this earth or find his way out. In my 26 years, I've never seen this kind of epidemic before. Some new flowers for you, sweetheart. I love you, baby. I thought I was out there living. And I was just dying. I created my own prison. I don't want my kids looking in a casket. Están peleando con un enemigo muy grande que se llama dinero. We are getting drug dealers off the street. At least this way we can say we are making a difference. We all think addiction and drugs, it's not my neighborhood. And the reality is it is. This stuff is everywhere. Everybody, please welcome Matthew Heineman. Hey, man. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Um, right in Ohio? Is that where that is landing right there? That, that, that is Columbus. Columbus, right. Ohio, right? The heartland, as they say, so the heart of America, and that's where the sort of major part of this crisis, or that's at least where everybody talks about it, is happening, right? So when did you start shooting this, and what made you want to get involved? How did it happen? So I was, uh, I made a film called Cartel Land, uh, about these two different vigilante groups on, on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border, fighting against the Mexican drug cartels, and, and traveling with that film, and, um, you know, film I'm very proud of, uh, but obviously there's a much, there's a much larger story to be told about the drug war. And so uh, through conversations, and then ultimately through conversations with Showtime, uh, developed this concept to uh, look at the drug war through multiple lenses, um, through the prism of, of heroin, through the prism of the, of the opioid epidemic, and uh, brought together a team of friends and uh, investigative journalists uh, to start researching the topic, uh, to see where we wanted to focus our cameras. Did you kind of send out different crews to all these different sort of stories and then pull the footage back and, and edit? Yeah, this is a much, much different uh, experience for me. Um, I'm norm Usually you're there, you're shooting it in, in your past two films, that I, the last two that I saw, City yeah. and uh, City of Ghosts and the, car and the Cartel, you are there shooting it. And then you edit your films as well, usually. 
Yeah, so for this, uh, we had an amazing, amazing group of uh, DPs and uh, field producers who are out there capturing the stories. Um, and it, again, a, a much different experience for me because I'm normally out there myself. Um, but we were, you know, we're filming in multiple locations at once, uh, multiple countries, obviously. Um, and you know, they they did an incredible, incredible job. How did you? How was it for you relinquishing that control? And what kind of direction did you give to them? So then the hopes that you would get footage that came back looking like what is sort of what you would consider your natural aesthetic? Um, yeah, I'm a bit of a control freak, so it's hard to relinquish some of that control. Uh, no, I mean, I, I wanted to have it, you know, have the show have the same aesthetic as, as my previous two films, and, and especially Cartel Land um, brought together a lot of the same team that, that, that worked on uh, that film. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think this is a, you know, there's no stats in the show. There's no talking heads. Um, there's no, you know, real context uh, to the epidemic. My goal, I felt like my job was to put a human face to this topic. It's so often relegated to headlines. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's obviously become a buzzword used by politicians and ping pong around uh, DC, but, you know, I felt like my job was to allow audiences um, who might not otherwise engage with the issue, might, might keep it at arm's length, to, to empathize uh, with the characters that we followed. And so, you know, it, it largely takes place in, in three places, in, in Guerrero, uh, Mexico, uh, with poppy growers and, and cartel members down there who are growing and transporting. Um, the most lucrative, essentially, poppy field in, in Mexico, right? Or like in the, it, yeah, it's, it's sort of uh, the region where, where most poppies are, are, are grown. Um, and then addicts in, in the U.S., uh, you know, a few in different places, but, you know, one of our main characters in, in Atlanta, and then law enforcement um, in Columbus, uh, Ohio, and so I, you know, again, I really wanted to to highlight the lives and the people who are affected by this epidemic, um, with a goal again that that hopefully people have a much greater understanding um, by by being able to connect and empathize and understand um, all of these people who are trapped uh, by the cycle of addiction, the cycle of addiction and the cycle of the economy of of drugs. Um, what were you most surprised by when it came to covering law enforcement? Um, you know, it took many, many months to get access uh, to film uh, with the law enforcement. Um, How many, did you go to like lots of different sort of law enforcement areas with when, law enforcement? And, yeah, yeah, got rejected from a number of different places. Um, but we originally started uh, at the federal level, with the Department of Homeland Security, to try to, you know, zone in on where we wanted to film, and ultimately we needed you know, permission from them to be able to film um, active investigations, uh, and, and so you know, that was a very difficult thing. And then ultimately we, we landed in Columbus with, with an amazing uh, sheriff's department there. Um, How do you navigate that with DHS? What are, they, what are they trying to make sure of, and what do you have to tell them? And did you have to change your approach and your thoughts about how you were gonna approach it based off of obligations or rules that they put out there? Um, approach is the same, again, whether you're a big federal agency or whether you're an addict in, in, in Atlanta or wherever you are. Um, it's, it's the stories that I want to tell and, 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 and what we see in, in the trade are, you know, very intimate um, verite with, 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 with access um, that most people haven't seen. And so... That was, you know, that was always the beginning of every conversation. Is if it, if we're not going to get access, if we're not going to get intimacy, if we're not going to get, um, you know, if we're going to be blocked at every step along the way, then you know we should just stop this conversation. And so um, that's how those conversations began with with DHS, uh, and it was just a matter of finding the right place to to get that access. And what was it like when you got there and you started working with the uh, with the officers? How much time did it take to develop? Uh, not a rapport, but make them comfortable around the cameras, sort of make them go about their daily routines with a the camera there? Um, weeks and weeks and months and months. You know, I, again, I, that was a 
um, the, you know, largely the work of an amazing field producer, yeah. uh, Brett Conkel, and, and, and our DP down there, Peter Hutchins, who did an incredible job on, on that storyline. Um, you know, I've always found that, that access like that doesn't happen overnight. Um, you can't just knock on someone's door and sort of say, you know, can I hang out with you for a day? It happens over weeks and weeks and months and months um, until you become a part of the fabric of their daily lives. And that's uh, what we tried to do and I think hopefully what we were able to do. What were you most uh, shocked by when it came to covering the, I mean, you covered the cartels before with the cartel, too, or not the cartels, excuse me, covered sort of two vigilante crews in regards to cartels uh, in the cartel. And now covering this sort of, this, the crisis in this kind of scope, what shocked you the most? Um, it's called Cartel Land. But oh, I'm so sorry. Um, the cartel is a, is a Don, uh, is a novel. Don Winslow. Yeah, Don book. Winslow. A good um, Don Winslow book. It's a great but book. Yeah, yeah, I apologize. It's okay. Um... <laughs> I think, was I surprised in general or, or, or in regards yeah, to... I mean, I think the, the opiate crisis is talked about on a daily basis, like you said, and it's become political football in a lot of ways. And we see all these headlines and, you know, it's become the leading... ODs have become the leading cause of death of, like, 20 to 49-year-olds right now, like, out beating guns and, and car crashes almost put together, I believe. So what when you get the cameras set up and you're actually cutting this and you're looking at all of it, what are you most shocked by? Not just your footage, but maybe just the fact that is there anything being done about this? Is enough being done about this? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this is not a policy film. I'm not a policy expert. Um, you're not going to see the show and walk away with a solution on how to fix this problem. Um, I will say with hope, the, the, law, the officers, there, there's solutions there that they're working towards. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there, there, there's, I find hope, not necessarily in the federal government, um, I find hope in, in individuals, in individuals fighting on the local level, um, individuals who are fighting to escape that, that cycle of addiction. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, all of these carriers are, are trapped. They're trying to escape from this, um, but, th but they can't. And, you know, when you look at the, the poppy growers, in Guerrero, or, 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 you know, in many ways, they're just farmers. Oh, yeah. They're farmers who are cultivating a crop. It just so happens that that crop is, is poppy gum that also ultimately becomes heroin, that ultimately gets transported northward, and ultimately gets um, consumed by an addict somewhere in the U.S. that may or may not OD and die, uh, and that that product will ravage communities all across the country, but for them, they're just getting by. You know, they're just trying to provide for their family. And so again, that, 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 that's one of our goals is, you know, these issues aren't black and white. You know, just because you're attached to the drug trade doesn't mean you're a bad person. Um, you know, they're just, again, they're just human beings with families who are trying to get by. Um, and if you had no other options, or you were threatened to be, uh, you know, to do that job, with no other choice, what would you do? Um, and so, uh, you know, I think these very complicated decisions that we're all faced with every single day, I wanted audiences to be, uh, you know, be up close and personal and, and try to put themselves in, in, in their shoes to try to understand what, 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 you know, what decisions w would you make? Um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the addicts that, that we followed, I think one thing that surprised me was, I mean, obviously, you know, We've all seen addiction with, with friends and with family, and um, but just the scope of um, how much this has ravaged communities around around the U.S. Um, and, and and honestly, how hard it is to break the cycle. Um, I think that was was really shocking to me, and we really need to stop thinking of this issue as a war. Um, we really need to stop thinking of this as something that we can police or that we can build walls to stop it from happening. Um, this is a, you know, a healthcare crisis. It's a disease. And we need to start thinking of it more as that, as opposed to something that we can police or, or build walls or fight. Um, because clearly, 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 that policy of thinking of this as a war has not uh, benefited really anybody.
Yeah, at the same time, it's become an entrenched policy. I know you're not a policy expert, but it's become an entrenched policy because uh, economies are also based off of this war in a lot of ways. And there are companies that do profit and make money off of this, off of this war. Yeah, I mean, but the basis of this war is something that is not going to change, and that is just simple economics, yeah. supply and demand. As long as there's a demand for drugs in the U.S., there will be a supply of drugs coming from Mexico. And that's just a fact. And if you get rid of a cartel boss in Mexico and you, you know, it's not going to change this basic economic structure. Someone will just step in and fill their, fill their spot. You know, if you take an, a, a dealer off the streets in, in one place, someone else will just step onto that corner and fulfill that need. And so I don't mean to be a pes pessimist, but th those are just economic realities that, that are at play here. And so, um, it's a, it's a reality that we've been living with since the drug war started, and it's, it's lessons that we've already learned in the last, like, 10, 15 years. It's yeah. very public, and people have been talking about it, yet it doesn't seem that we have really changed or moved forward with policy. One of the most hopeful things in the film is hope, the, this, this drug enforcement uh, force that is created in Ohio that starts essentially driving at it, like picking up addicts that they've arrested before, right, and driving them to rehab facilities. They, they essentially in some ways become, and they say in the film, social workers, right? Yeah, the, the, you know, they are really infiltrating the communities to try to help addicts get treatment. Um, they're also prosecuting uh, dealers who are... Um, who are responsible for, for folks who have either OD'd or, or died um, to try to get them off the streets. Uh, you know, we found a lot of hope <laughs> in the HOPE Task Force um, in Columbus. Similar um, task forces exist, you know, in communities and cities all across America. And so, again, there, there are innovative um, ways that this is being addressed um, at, at the local level, especially. When it comes to the addicts, I think one, something that uh, people don't realize or kind of forget when it comes to specifically heroin users is that the chemical makeup of the brain is almost completely changed once you've become an intravenous drug user for a certain period of time. So this idea of like getting clean, you know, not only do you have this sort of a, the disease of addiction, but now you have this other completely made, like a disoriented, remade brain that now just relies on these drugs to get by, even after you go through withdrawals. Did you find uh, when you, inter I mean, because you basically choose a group of addicts who seem to come from great families. Was that part of the intention behind finding these addicts? Like making sure that they, the audience couldn't essentially like find a reason for their drug problems? Yeah, I mean, I think, I guess uh, going back to that question, I mean, that was another thing that surprised me is, um, you know, this is not a, this is not an urban problem. This is not a suburban problem. This is not an exurban problem. This is a problem that has ravaged communities all across this country. Um, it doesn't discriminate by race or by class. Um, and so that's one of the things that we tried to highlight. And I think, you know, one of the sad things is that, you know, the, and we don't, you know, we don't necessarily fully dive into this um, in the show, because again, it's not a policy show. Um, or show about the history of the drug war or the history of this epidemic. But, but that said, I think it's impossible to not come away with inferrals in regards to those, in, to, in regards to policy and the history of the drug war by watching just the sort of daily lives of the people that are a part of all of these parts of the trade. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I hope so. I think that, that that's, that's the goal. But what I was going to say was that I, th I think, you know, a big culprit here is the, is the pharmaceutical industry um, who has been pushing, 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 um, opiates on on patients, you know, the, the way this sort of economic structure of our healthcare system, which I examined in uh, my first feature film, feature documentary, uh, Escape Fire, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, you know, we're paid to do things. Doctors are paid to, you know, uh, do procedures, to prescribe pills. Um, you know, this fee-for-service model makes absolutely no sense. And this fee-for-service model has... Uh, incentivize doctors to prescribe more. And one of the things that they prescribe more of is opiates. And so many addicts, you know, start out with, not, not all, but so many addicts start out with a ankle injury or knee injury or hip injury. 
and they just get addicted to, to the opiates. Um, just being a regular sort of experimenting drug user and the excess of pills, the abundance of pills in your community allows for you to get access to them via, you know, your parents' medicine cabinet or buying them on the street somewhere, you know, but just the fact that there is an abundance of pills. Like, what is that West Virginia town recently, this small town that was getting prescribed millions of pills in this town of like 2,800 or something like that? Of course kids are going to get it on the street. It's not that hard. To, it's not going to be hard to find. No, I mean, it, it's, it's ubiquitous, and it, it's, it's, you know, it's so easy to find, and, and, you know, it's being laced with fentanyl, which is, you know, much, much stronger than, than, than heroin and much, much more dangerous. Um, you know, fentanyl is, is so dangerous that, um, you know, it, if it, can, it touches your skin, you can OD just by having it touch your skin. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing more and more, you know, overdose deaths, uh, as a result of people un unknowingly using heroin that is laced with fentanyl, um, and that's you know increasing, increasing, increasing uh, every single day, and so um, yeah, I, I hope I hope that one day this 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 epidemic will uh, be addressed in 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 a way that um, puts patients first, puts addicts first, um, but also changes you know, the whole thought process and how we're addressing it. Let's get some questions uh, from our audience. Who's right here? Hi. Um, thank you for being here. Um, in all your previous work, you've chosen really hard-hitting topics. I'm really interested in how you choose what topics you'd like to actually feature and make a documentary for. Um, I feel like the topics always pick me. Um, I, don't, I don't sort of... Um, I don't think I've ever done a project that's been sort of given to me. Um, it's always just something hits me, and I, and I feel compelled uh, to do it. And and I, I feel like, obviously, if you if you look at the films I've done, they've they've all been topical. Um, they've been you know about some some something in the zeitgeist of what's being discussed. Um, but I I think one common denominator too is is what we've been talking about is that these issues, whether it's healthcare. Um, you know, ISIS, um, cartel land, or, or, or this, you know, these, these issues are so often simplified um, and, 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 and discussed in a way that people don't really understand it. And, and, I, and, and, and my strong, strong belief is that by telling human stories, um, you can allow audiences to engage in the subject matter. Um, and so that's what I've at least attempted to do. Do you ever, when you, when you tell these human stories, uh, and, and you, do you ever feel at the end of them, is there ever a part of you that wishes you could inject that, like more uh, sort of polemics to, to change people's minds? Uh, their minds or the audience? The audience's minds, right? So you tell, like, for instance, The Trade is this amazing verite series that covers all of these things, and hopefully someone does walk away with it with their mind kind of changed or a bit more thoughtful in regards to the drug trade, but is there ever a part of you when you're done that's kind of like, oh, maybe I should throw one expert in there just to tell someone how to th tell people exactly how to think about this? Because clearly you have your own opinions, I'm sure, as to the best way to go about policing or taking care of addicts or dealing or stabilizing the economy in Mexico so that people don't, farmers aren't you know, shipping poppy into the United States. Um, I've never had that inclination, really. <laughs> I, yeah, I just think that, you know, once you start, I think context is a slippery slope, and once you start introducing talking heads and you start introducing, you know, points of view, um, it just immediately creates a distance between the audience and the subject matter. Um, you know, I also strongly believe in not scripting what you're doing. You know, when we started this, we had no idea where, where the series was going to go, where the characters were going to go, where the subject was going to go. Um, and that's been the same with every single one of my projects. And, you know, I think I might have said this to you last time we talked, but, you know, it's still true in my career now. You know, a mentor of mine told me that if you end up with the story you started with, then you weren't listening along the way. And, and that's good advice for life, and that's good advice for filmmaking, um, is be open to the story changing. Be open to, um, you know, the characters going in a way that you might not have ever thought they'd go. Um, and so, you know, that's what makes it exciting uh, to make and, and also hard.
hard to make as well. Next question. Hi. Um, out of all the locations that are in your film, if you could pick one to visit, where would you go? For vacation? Or no, for I'm just saying just to, like, while you were filming. <laughs> okay. Um, visit in terms of like... If you were able to film it out of all these locations you, that were in it, right. where would you go? If uh, you could only pick one. I wouldn't suggest going to Mexico, um, at least Guerrero. You know, it's not the safest place in the world. It's, 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 and that's, you know, that's one of the tragedies uh, of Mexico uh, and one of the reasons why I wanted to do this again after Cartel Land, one of the reasons I, I made Cartel Land uh, is, you know, I, I fell in love with the people of Mexico. I fell in love with the place. You know, it's such a beautiful place with beautiful people, so many of whom are, are trapped in this, in this horrible war, in this horrible cycle. Um, you know, since the war on drugs began in Mexico in roughly 2007, well over 100,000 people have been killed. Well over 25,000 plus people disappeared, gone, never heard from again. Um, you know, so many of whom have nothing to do with the drug trade are just innocent civilians who are caught um, in the middle. And that's that's the you know one of the tragedies. I'm not sure I answered your question, but I, I guess I'm saying don't go to Guerrero. But um, was a good, at least don't was don't a good go answer. on vacation there. If you want to go tell a story, then um, go. But. I need to have for one more right here. Good morning, Matthew. Um, I really like your your whole point on like not policing the subject. I think like even since the crack epidemic. It's became something that we've associated with like criminalized behavior. And like even as a former user, I think it's more important to dwell into like the aspect of how are we inside this like unescapable cage, like the societal cage that makes us want to imaginatively or in reality slip outside of that for a second. And like that pressure is kind of like responsible in some way. For the for the actions that some of these people make, and I would just like to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, sorry, who in, responsible in 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 what in what sense? In the sense of like, so we're kind of like just brought into this world with all these societal pressures to where people can feel overwhelmed and like they seek relief from from these pressures using substances. And in a way, we try to like call it disease and this and that. And I don't think anybody ever like takes the time to empathize with that aspect of an addict, if that makes sense. Completely. And and thank you for for saying that. I I think that's that's one of my. I don't know if you've seen the first episode or 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 anything. Hopefully, you'll, you'll get to see the show. Um, that's you know that was one of my big goals is to show that um, you know addicts are human beings. Addicts, uh, you know, they're not. Um, you know, they are, uh, they would love to get off this drug. I mean, that, that, that was the common denominator with almost every single addict we filmed with. No one wanted to be doing what they're doing. No one enjoyed being an addict. No one enjoyed being, you know, a, a junkie on the street going to, you know, ask for money and go back to their trailer and use heroin and then OD or, um, you know, that cycle of, of just of continuing to use, no one enjoyed that. Um, and so I think, again, one of the goals of, of the show is to help audience members who might not ha know an addict or have an addict in their family um, help understand the psychology of, of the, this is, again, a, a disease, a human, a healthcare crisis um, that, that needs to be thought of as such. And, you know, in, in so many of the addicts that we filmed with, weren't able to get help, couldn't afford it, wasn't there. They relapsed, kicked back down the street and weren't given a second chance. Um, and so, again, I, that's, that's one of the things that we really tried to show is, is the struggle of addicts really trying to break free from the shackles of addiction. I'm excited to see it. What do you think is the prevailing reason for uh Americans or drug drug addiction of this of of this magnitude being so uniquely American. 
Um, I don't know if it's. I, I just asked. Russia the, has a heroin problem as well. Yeah, I just asked that the other day. I'm not sure if, if it's. A, I mean, I think people use drugs all across the world. I don't. I don't know if it's an, an American um, problem. I do think. I think think the the undue influence of the pharmaceutical industry is, is specifically um, American. Uh, you know, the, the 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 influence of the pharmaceutical industry in peddling opiates and having that be a starting point for many addicts. Um, I think that is. Uh, partly more American than, than other uh, countries and, and situations in other countries. Um, well, America is one of only two, I think, Western countries that allows pharmaceutical companies to advertise. Yes. Right. Yes. So, Which is insane. Um, I think, I, I think there were, for a little while they were running that commercial that was like for people suffering from opioid induced constipation, which was like the craziest thing to have. It's like we're not even telling people not to take opiates anymore. We're giving them a relief for one of the side effects of opiates, and we're advertising for it. Yeah, I mean the it's I mean it's 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 tragically comical watching those ads of uh, you know drugs that are being used to treat the side effects of a drug and the side effects of that drug. I mean sometimes it's like three steps removed from the original drug that we're treating uh, the effects of. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, and then on the, I guess on the other side of things in terms of, um, you know, this American sort of need for a quick fix is, is so often I get asked, you know, for that like silver bullet on how to fix this problem um, on, on the other side of things. And, you know, I, this is not, this issue is not something that can just be fixed with, with, you know, the stroke of a, a wand or, or some politician um, enacting a law, it's a multifactorial problem that will require multifactorial solutions um, on the local level, on the federal level, on the human level. Um, and, and, and I really hope we, we start to look at it as such. I think that's exactly what the trade attempts to do is present the sort of multi-facts, multifactorial, as you said, uh, level of the drug trade. Uh, it's on Showtime right now, right? It just started airing. When can people watch? It's, uh, yeah, the first episode uh, aired last Friday. The second episode airs tomorrow uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. And so it's five episodes. And, yeah, if, if, if you... Um, you know, care about this issue, you know, I hope, please tell your friends, you know, shows like this, uh, you know, are all about word of mouth, so please spread the word if you, if you believe in it. Well, Matthew, congratulations on the trade, and uh, if you haven't seen it, see his film from last year, City of Ghosts. I can't recommend it enough. Matthew Heineman, everybody. Let's hear it. Thank you.